Co-founder of Ambit Energy, Chris Chambliss, opened the 2011 MLM Ambit Ambition Conference by trying to make his company appear thoughtful and caring. And I know the clever wordplay of Ambit and ambition, just so spicy. However, the reason I say he tried to make them sound thoughtful is because in my opinion, Chris failed so miserably at doing this that the end result is a cringeworthy, laughable, cookie cutter presentation. Let's start with the black and white footage of an empty warehouse. Chris is walking around it pacing while so many different shots of the same room fill up the presentation screen. While Chris stares into space, that sweet royalty-free basic guitar music starts to play. Are you getting the right tools you need to succeed? I have the greatest job. I'm proud of the foundation we've made. Chris's opening looks like he's about to start listing side effects of a medication if I'm gonna be honest here. I'm half expecting him to tell the crowd that Ambit Energy may cause heart palpitations and headaches or something. So on the surface, yeah, this is what Ambit Energy looks like, just another laughable MLM. And like any other pyramid shaped company we've seen, Chris talks about the financial freedom that implies only his MLM can offer to other distributors. Where most people see problems, you guys see promise. And where most people see a simple electric bill, you see financial freedom. And I'm telling you- So yeah, this went from a medication commercial to a very questionable sales pitch real fast. Chris also takes these join us eerie vibes one step further when he tells the consultants in attendance that they're special and a higher power. And I assume he's referring to God as the higher power has decided that their company would be successful. And I'm sorry, but is Chris saying that he speaks to God now? Otherwise, how the hell would he know? Now, these culty vibes aren't uncommon at these types of conferences and the generic motivational speech giving founder is practically a requirement of MLMs at this point. At least it kind of seems that way. But I do have to give Ambit credit. At least they come right out and say they believe they're chosen by God instead of just acting like it. Right from the start, after only a single cheesy video, you may think that we're in for the usual. We've got an MLM with fake income claims, no real means of earning money and a shoddy product. And to some extent, you're absolutely correct. But Ambit Energy is so much more interesting than that. They're supposedly all about clean energy, but they might charge you three times as much as your typical energy bill and sometimes without telling you. And it can cost hundreds just to sign up with them. And oh, one tiny problem. They're also actually owned by coal companies. Hello and welcome to Multi-Level Mondays, not on a Monday. I don't wanna hear it. I had a really rough weekend, I apologize, but we are here now. I'm the Illuminati and today we're gonna be talking about Ambit Energy. So first and foremost, I wanna put it out there that I don't think individuals are really the problem with pollution. While plenty of people recycle and switch to solar and whatnot, big oil companies are causing long-term damage that we can't even put a dent in to try and fix, repair, or even lessen. So the way that clean energy companies advertise like there's some great, responsible, amazing business that's changing the world can be problematic in of itself. But this isn't necessarily an ambit problem. What is it that they do? I'll start by asking you yet another question. Let's say you and your friends start a business together. Obviously, both of you are going to love it, be heavily invested and be satisfied with the product. And you guys are really happy with the work you've done. And there's nothing wrong with that. But here's the catch. Do you two have any customers yet? Maybe you two consider yourselves customers if you're using the product, but surely you won't hang a slogan on your wall that says you're the finest and most respected company in America because you have a 100% customer satisfaction rate. That would be disingenuous, right? According to Dallas Magazine, that's almost exactly what the founders, Jerry Thompson and Chris Chambliss did. It's not all that clear if the founders really believe they were the best thing since sliced bread with only two customers, or if they put this slogan on the wall to set it for themselves. If it's the first, it's yet another cringy, ridiculous moment for Ambit. If it's the second, well, as the magazine article puts it, they weren't off to the finest start. And almost the very moment that Ambit Energy began, they decided to pick a fight with another kind of energy MLM called Steam Energy. Apparently, Ambit said Steam was interfering with their plans to buy energy on the wholesale market. Chambliss compared themselves to Lowe's and Home Depot competing or Target and Walmart. And don't get me wrong, competition is a healthy thing as it prevents monopolies and Steam is an entirely separate MLM with its own host of issues. It seems a bit ridiculous that Ambit would just enter the market two years after Steam did and then take issue with Steam existing. But it gets better because according to Steam Energy, Ambit was actually copying their marketing materials. 
Now, Ambit wasn't some incredible new company that was going to do things differently. They, in my opinion, basically just used Steam who hit over 80 million in sales in 10 months as just a blueprint and then had to apologize once they were caught, making them appear like a jealous brat. Petty as these co-founders were, they refused to even use Steam's name in interviews, probably because they were so humiliated. Now, this isn't the only point of contention when it comes to how they run their business. Dallas Magazine says they are slightly big brotherish in how they ask their consultants to check in on and flag each other from time to time. And it doesn't matter if it's for praise or criticism, Chambliss has said as much stating this, if you join Ambit and you don't want to do it the right way, you won't last very long. It doesn't take Jerry or I to find those people now. We have an army who love what we're doing and love our company, they'll police it. I know that automatically calling an MLM a cult is jumping the gun a bit, but wow, does that seem like a freaking cult? Like just tell me that's not a bit suspicious. Ambit picks fights with MLMs that were around before them. And it seems like they pick fights within their own company too. Like who the fuck would wanna work there after hearing this? I sure do not. This has to be one of the biggest red flag statements from a co-founder, yet Chambliss sounds like he's actually proud of himself. I also have to wonder if he refers to Ambit consultants as a volunteer army at points, like maybe because they just get paid so little. The co-founder also makes a big deal of discussing how the supposed army will leave him if he has continual payroll issues, which uh, yeah, an employee who isn't getting paid is going to quit. Like that's kind of obvious. I didn't realize that was something that needed to be said like that, but I guess Chambliss really wanted to hammer home that his company has standards, no matter how low they might be. So let's take a look at these standards a little bit more, shall we? We dived into Ambit's beginnings as a company, but it's time to get back a little bit further. Who are Jerry and Chris and what made them start Ambit in the first place? Jerry Thompson Jr. and Chris Chambliss were chatting about energy deregulation in 2006. At the time, Chris was the chief marketing officer at Excel and Jerry was the CEO of Caprock Communications, a telecom firm he grew to $300 million before ultimately selling it. Together with their powers combined, they decided to build a new energy provider and bought a warehouse in Dallas to do so. And it wasn't all that hard. Thompson already applied to sell electric power on the retail market in Texas before even meeting Chambliss. It seems like he was going to do that through a different company called Blue Vista, but the key difference is that Thompson wasn't on as board with the direct sales model as Chambliss was. He didn't have the experience telling Dallas Magazine, the biggest uncertainty that hung over me was that I'd never been in direct sales before. Thompson told Inc. Magazine something similar a few years prior, but his words were a little more revealing. I admit that I did have some concerns about using direct sales and multi-level marketing. Chris and I were concerned about our reputations. We didn't wanna wake up in five years with a big company, but feel embarrassed about how we did it. Now I've got absolutely no idea whatsoever how Chambliss actually convinced Thompson to go through with this. I know MLM sellers can be persuasive when they want to be. And it seems like that's kind of what happened here. Thompson sounded hesitant, like he was trying to go about things the right way. Whereas Chambliss saw a cash cow and a brand new way to get a loyal downline. I mean, ooh, sorry, customer base, whatever you wanna call it. But again, that's just how I see it. That's my silly little goofy, quirky pyramid opinion. Without all that much on the Cole founders' backstories, it's kind of hard to know for sure what their intentions really were. What is clear is that Thompson's grandfather, Joe C. Thompson, helped found 7-Eleven back in the 1920s and Excel where Chambliss worked. And Excel, just FYI, since I also made the little Steam comment earlier, it's not part of Microsoft suite. I don't, that's where I was thinking too, but it was apparently a phone carrier MLM that went defunct. In the 1990s, it was even the fifth largest long distance carrier in the US, thanks to what Forbes calls its chain letter scheme. Forbes added at the end of the article that things were working so well for Excel that even AT&T is trying to copy it because, you know, of course AT&T would. And for a while, Excel did work beautifully. If you were at the top of this chain mail or Ponzi plan as Pyramid Scheme Alert called it, the vice president of marketing earned $5 every time a representative or trainer signed up, making him millions through year through signups, not sales. The company also spread out the cost of commissions that they planned to gain new subscribers instead of immediately deducting them from expenses, reducing their marketing costs by two thirds of their operating income. Even the Forbes article that praised them implied something shady was going on saying, most recruits pay $195 to join. Excel is the country's fifth largest long distance company with 4.1 million customers, but Excel also boasts 1 million sales reps. That means the average Excel rep only has four customers and one of them is themselves. No wonder the turnover rate is so high. Vartech, the company that eventually bought Excel and where Chambliss briefly worked, abandoned Excel in 2004. 
They said they couldn't support Excel's marketing model, which is funny considering that they'd collaborated with multiple MLMs before, but I guess suddenly they changed their mind. It's a good start. Now, as of right now, it looks like Thompson is a rich 7-Eleven heir that got taken for a ride by an MLM supporter who converted his idea of a clean energy business into yet another Ponzi plan, right? Well, that's still actually not the whole story because Thompson isn't squeaky clean either. Despite wanting a clean energy business, he's not squeaky clean, get it? Ha ha, I know, I'm, I'm hilarious. You guys can thank me for that one later. Remember how Jerry started Caprock Communications? Well, they were actually caught up in a massive securities fraud class action lawsuit around the time Vartek let Excel go. Apparently, Caprock would install fiber optic cables on private property without compensating or getting permission from homeowners. You know, sure, Jerry, you and your friend wanted to create a really respectable business all about customer satisfaction. And I'm sorry, but I just personally find that very hard to believe. I find it even harder to believe when Jerry doesn't even mention this controversy and seems to pretend it doesn't exist. If you want to do better and make a new company, that's great. But owning up to shitty questionable practices is kind of the first step in doing that. Oh, and if the name Caprock is kind of itching your brain a little bit, it sounds just a hair familiar, it's because they worked with Enron to build their fiber optic network. And yes, that Enron. Again, not really a great addition to their aspiring clean image. So between the lawsuits, associations with Enron and defunct MLMs, it's kind of hard for me to see these two as ever being legitimate in the first place. And once Ambit hit the market, it isn't hard to see why. Reviews insisted that they were not a scam, yet with 1 million customers and around 200,000 sellers in 2012, this meant each consultant had around five clients at one time and likely it included themselves. Their compensation plan, in my opinion, is an absolute headache to understand, but the end result is the same that I've always seen. You need to be at the top of the food chain, or as Ambit likes to call it, the top of their layers to make a livable wage. Not to mention, it can also cost about $500 just to sign up and be fed all of these promises about free travel, cruises, and getaways. A class action lawsuit was brought against Ambit for this very reason, but many of the claims were dismissed because Ambit does disclose its rates in their terms of service. So sure, technically you can end up getting a cruise from Ambit, but I feel the way these MLMs represent this possibility is so overblown and deceptive that judges should be coming down harder on these marketing practices, not giving them a free pass. Thankfully, plenty of other lawsuits have been brought against Ambit too. Stephanie Mensimer, a senior reporter for Mother Jones, wrote that Ambit accumulated about $57,000 in fines between 2010 and 2012 for violating consumer protection rules. Now, again, that's absolutely nothing, merely a cost of doing business kind of fine. But these violations were a sign of things to come because as the years went on, more and more complaints began piling up. And we've got the works here. We've got overcharging customers, overstating what other providers would charge and using deceptive practices to make customers switch their services. So let's start with the overcharging complaints. Electric deregulation has failed to live up to lower cost promises for years. The Associated Press wrote in 2007, consumers in the 17 deregulated areas paid an average of 30% more for power in 2006 than their counterparts in regulated states. In 2014, Consumer Affairs said that not much had changed, especially when it came to Ambit. Jay from Hamden, Connecticut left a review that read, I selected Ambit Energy as my electric supplier a year ago because of their low locked in rates. Without warning, my rates tripled in March, 2014. I went to their website, found that my rates had tripled and selected a new low rate plan. Then I reviewed my April bill. My new rate was not applied to the bill. So once again, my bill was triple what it should be. I tried calling the company repeatedly. Some reviewers said their rates even tripled despite gas rates going down everywhere else, alleging that this was downright cheating and the company double crossed them. And this is absolutely a bad look when your customers have almost nothing but bad things to say, but it becomes extra scummy when many of these customers only signed up in the first place because they were asked to by a friend or family member. And if I were in Jay's position, I'd be contacting whatever relative told me to switch and start demanding some answers. So much for that little plaque on their wall that says they're the most respected company in alternative energy, right? Now, the extreme price gouging eventually led to litigation. Little V Ambit Energy Holdings was filed on behalf of consumers in New York, New Jersey, and Maryland. According to court documents, plaintiffs Josh Little, Samantha Mason, and Gregory Stewart, as well as others similarly situated, were treated like absolute garbage. Basically, Ambit would tell customers what they needed based on their prior usage, which is a process they call budget billing. 
but they failed to disclose any actual energy supply rates. Their so-called estimates were purposefully way off the mark, which is pretty fucking gross, right? Well, it's too bad leaving Ambit isn't easy either. When the plaintiffs in the case figured out that Ambit wasn't nearly as great as it was cracked up to be, they tried to cancel their services only to be told that they owed Ambit thousands of dollars that they were not aware of. You'd think that Ambit would explain in great detail why this is and give their customers a thorough explanation, but they couldn't even be bothered to send a breakdown of these bills. Again, it really doesn't seem like they deserve that whole, we're the best in alternative energy we decided slogan. Now, despite this seeming like a very obvious fraud to me, a New Jersey judge, Judge Ship, argued that Ambit did disclose their rates in their terms of service, if you were reading the fine print hard enough, of course. So take note, energy companies, if you write in really, really little tiny print that you know, you're going to mislead your customers, then it's all good, it's all gravy, baby. Thankfully, settlements were reached for some of these accusations. So before we get to eventual payouts, let's take a look at the next claim, their savings guarantees. In the case of Simmons v. Ambit Energy Holdings, Teresha Simmons and numerous other plaintiffs alleged that Ambit also advertised a guaranteed savings plan. Not only were they making promises about staying cheap, but here they made promises about being better than everyone else by exactly 1%. It assured customers their 12 month energy costs would be at least 1% less than their existing cost or Ambit would refund the difference. So what a great brag, right? Like we'll be better by exactly one single percentage. Now, the thing is, while I can't speak for everyone that signed up for Ambit, people didn't switch to save 1% on their energy bill. Many of them were hoping to save a lot more. For New York residents, they didn't even get this much. Ambit took the guaranteed 1% plan away from them and switched them to the New York Select Variable Plan, allegedly without notifying New Yorkers in the first place. Michelle Fraser said that he switched without knowledge or consent and he was charged rates three times higher than National Grid. Ambit also refused to issue him a refund too. And correct me if I'm wrong here, but wasn't the whole point of Ambit that it was like supposed to be better than National Grid and traditional suppliers? Like that's what the founders said, right? Isn't that what these distributors claim when they convince their friends and family members to sign up? So how in the world do they actually justify these prices? By this point in time, New York was pretty fed up with Ambit and wanted those answers too. This 1% guarantee stunt was just the cherry on top. Back in 2014, they had hundreds of complaints about higher than expected charges with Audrey Zeibelman, CEO of the New York State Department of Public Service saying, "'Department staff has concerns over the apparent lack of renewal notices, consumer disclosure complaints, as well as Ambit's practice of moving people off the guaranteed savings plan into a variable rate plan that had significantly higher rates than the utility." Governor Cuomo also launched a 2015 investigation that resulted in almost a million dollars worth of energy bill refunds, around $600 to 1,500 people. With that many customers getting hundreds of dollars back, it demonstrates that in all likelihood, this was a systemic issue. A few people didn't just fall through the cracks here. Ambit was ripping off over a thousand people and dragging out their cases for years. But let's try to prove a little bit about their intent. Did Scambit, I'm so sorry, I must've read that wrong. Did Ambit mean to deceive their customers all along? Now, unsurprisingly, in yet another lawsuit, and I swear these are actually never ending at this point, Amy Silvis brought Ambit's good faith and fair dealing into play. She alleged that their teaser rate was anything but market-based. Sure, having an actual rate be a bit higher might happen, but that's what those asterisks on estimates are always for. But when Ambit was seemingly pulling too good to be true numbers out of their ass and acting like they're based on anything realistic, that's another problem entirely. And at first, a federal judge actually was siding with Ambit, but that result was overturned and a $9.3 million settlement was issued. Between that, the $1.5 million penalty for that 1% promise controversy and $20 million in refunds they had to issue, this comes to a little over $30 million over the past few years. That sounds like an expensive lesson, right? Like. Surely that must hurt a little bit, right? Well, you know that that's a bit of a redundant question because no, of course not. Ambit claimed they made $1.3 billion in 2018 alone. And that's when they settled a majority of these suits, by the way. Now, math of course is not my strong suit here, you guys know, but according to my calculations, 30 million would be only 1 43rd of what they made that year. Plus, if they're making so much money because they overcharge people, then how is Ambit really suffering when they're just paying back what they earned in an unfair way anyways? It stands to reason that if Ambit is only being fined a portion of their triple charges that far exceed the market value, then they're still making a giant profit. 
what lesson is actually being learned here? In my opinion, when a company is acting in bad faith, misrepresenting themselves, overcharging, and failing to even communicate with their customers, then they don't deserve to have CEOs rolling in dollar bills and seven figure fucking salaries. And let me be like perfectly transparently clear about this. MLM or not, pyramid shaped business model or not, this business fucking sucks from tip to tail. I'm not saying clean energy in of itself is a terrible thing, but from the sounds of it, you're better off going literally anywhere else if you really wanted to switch. Just literally don't go with Ambit apparently. A new year is a full year of possibilities, but when your e-commerce business is dealing with gift returns, late deliveries, and a mountain of customer emails, you can feel a bit stuck. But ShipStation helps you get there faster, whether you run a side hustle or a giant warehouse. You can keep customers happy and fulfill more orders than ever, all while cutting shipping costs and managing it from a single dashboard. Because let's be real, one of the more trickier parts of running a business when you have a physical product to sell is kind of the fulfillment part, especially when you gotta ship all over the US, all over the world, all over wherever. And ShipStation has some of the best rates in the industry with up to 86% off USPS and UPS rates. And ShipStation effortlessly integrates everywhere you sell online, including Amazon, Etsy, eBay, Shopify, and more. You can manage every order from one dashboard, automate routine shipping tasks, print shipping labels, and easily compare rates and delivery times to optimize every shipment, every time. Over 130,000 companies have grown their e-commerce businesses with ShipStation. And 98% of companies that stick with ShipStation for a year become customers for life. And that's saying something. So make the new year your best year and grow your business with ShipStation. Use promo code MLM today at ShipStation.com to sign up for your free 60-day trial. Again, that's ShipStation.com, use promo code MLM. And speaking about the new year, you've got new year's goals and HelloFresh is here to help you achieve them. Skip the grocery store and take control of your time and budget with delicious recipes delivered right to your door. One of my favorite parts of HelloFresh are their fast and fresh recipes. It's the fastest and latest line of meals, including robust flavors and filling portions, and they're ready in less than 15 minutes. Enjoy the taste and quality done quick with recipes like falafel power bowls, seared steak and potatoes with Bernays sauce or Southwest pork and bean burritos, which by the way, the falafel power bowls do not fuck with them. They are amazing. I'm sorry, HelloFresh, if you don't want me to say the F word, they are delightful. So skip the snowy schlep to the grocery store and stock up on snacks, sides, desserts, and more at the HelloFresh market. Simply add these staples and sweets to your weekly order and they'll arrive at your doorstep along with your meals. So go to hellofresh.com slash MLM21 and use code MLM21 for 21 free meals plus free shipping. Again, that's hellofresh.com slash MLM21 and use code MLM21 for 21 free meals plus free shipping. With all of these lawsuits in the not so distant past, what exactly is next for Ambit Energy? Are they actually going to clean up their act? That's doubtful. You see, in 2019, they were bought up by Vistra, a coal company for $475 million plus networking capital. Which by the way, that sounds really cheap for a supposed billion dollar company, but I digress. Now it's pretty smart on Vistra's part because it makes them look like they care more about the environment while simultaneously buying up the competition. According to Dallas Morning News, they've also spent hundreds of millions on solar projects. Their generation of coal is set to be cut in half by the next 10 years and renewable energy is set to take up 20% of their fuel sources by 2030. But they've faced some setbacks recently, losing a couple billion dollars in the extreme Texas storms a little while back. But we should encourage these moves, right? Well, the silly little goofy thing is, as much as I'd love to pat Vistra and Ambit on the back for at least trying to help the environment, flowery words and hopeful projections just aren't the full picture here. In June, 2019, the same year that Vistra bought Ambit, the Illinois Pollution Control Board or IPCB approved a revision for the state's air pollution standards, making them less stringent because that's what the world needs, right? A easier way to pollute. At the time, Obama's clean power plan had been rolled back. And even though Vistra said they were going to retire some of their Illinois plants, they had been able to continue running their dirtiest plants without any modern upgrades. The following year, the Sierra Club reported that Vistra was operating their Martin Lake coal plant, the top sulfur and mercury polluter in the US. Vistra promised that they were going to do better to make themselves look good, but in my opinion, that's all it was, empty promises. The very second they got that applause for striving to be clean, they turned around and changed basically nothing because why bother when the laws don't encourage them to do so anymore? 
Almost a year ago, Inside Climate News added that Illinois plants where Vistra is based had even higher emissions in 2021 than they did in 2020. So what happened to the whole getting better thing? What happened to retiring coal? When they have retired plants, it doesn't seem to be by choice either. Environmental groups sued the company for violating pollution limits hundreds of times. So closing down one of their plants is just part of these settlements. Plus, since burning coal is going to be largely banned, Vistra isn't acting out of the goodness of their hearts. They may wanna make it seem like it's that way for obvious reasons, but if Vistra had any kind of genuine care about pollution, they would have stopped a long time ago. Now, as for Ambit, here's where this leaves us. They're now owned by a coal company that in my opinion, doesn't actually give a shit about the environment, even if they want to appear that way. Their business model is trash and the way they manipulate and overcharge customers is equally as bad. Each supposed employee that's part of their weird volunteer army only has a few clients on average, typically friends and family that they've convinced to sign up on their behalf. The owners also have a record of shady activity, so it's really no surprise that Ambit is littered with lawsuits. To put it simply, they give clean energy a dirty name. But with all of that being said, that is where we're going to end today's episode. I hope you learned something new here today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date to all the latest episodes. Again, I do want to apologize that today's Multi-Level Mondays did not appear on Monday. Again, I had a bit of a chaotic week. I was moving for the past like two weeks. So it's been a lot and I still don't have internet in my house. So it is a bit of a struggle right now. So I really do apologize, but we are getting right back on track. So thank you all so much for joining me for today's episode. I really, really, really do appreciate it. I hope you're having a great start to your new year and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.